All right, good afternoon. On behalf of the Anaheim Ducks, welcome to the Girls Virtual College Fair National Collegiate Athletic Association NCAA webinar. We are so excited that you're here today joining us and we have some great guest speakers who will provide you with important information regarding the path to becoming a collegiate student athlete. My name is Jamie Riedel. I'm the youth hockey coordinator here with the Anaheim Ducks and I'll be moderating today's panel. Before we get started, there are a couple of items I'd like to note. First of all, you'll notice that all participants will be muted and your video will be disabled for the duration of today's webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded. The recording will be available on www.ducksgoal.com on Sunday evening, and our links will also be sent to you via email. Please feel free to utilize the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. We do have approximately 15 minutes of time dedicated to a live Q&A following today's panel, and we will try to address as many questions as we can at that time. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker to today's panel. Introducing Dan Callahan. Dan Callahan is the Assistant Athletic Director of Compliance at Trine University. He was a high school and college football and wrestling coach for 38 years. For 10 of those years, he was also the NCAA Compliance Coordinator for Trine University Athletics Program. When he started as Compliance Coordinator, Trine offered 21 sports and had approximately 500 students on campus. Trine now offers 34 sports and approximately 1,200 student athletes on campus. In 2018, he retired from coaching and became an assistant athletic director, or athletic director with a focus on NCAA compliance. And he now has 12 years of experience working with NCAA coaches and student athletes. Dan will discuss the process to becoming an NCAA student athlete, including rules and regulations, and highlight some of the differences between that process for Division I and Division III. With that said, I will hand it over to Dan Callahan. Dan, welcome. Well, thank you. Um, not real sure. I thought I'd go in two areas here. Uh, one would be to discuss recruiting and what a D3 coach can do in, in terms of recruiting and what a contact is. Uh, all of you student athletes are PSAs or prospective student athletes. And at the D3 level, our coaches are uh, limited a little bit more in what they can do. Uh, we do not have dead periods. We do not have quiet times. So we can contact our, our athletes uh, 365. However, we cannot have face-to-face -face contact with a student athlete at, off our campus unless that student athlete is a junior or a senior. We can have electronic contact with all of our student athletes, freshmen through seniors. Uh, electronic contact would be a telephone call, a text message. Uh, some social media contact is available, but not uh, a lot. If it's a social media contact, it would be a contact behind the scenes. It'd be a, a, a message through Facebook Messenger or a behind the IM, a PM through Twitter, uh, Instagram, etc. They cannot do anything publicly and can't have any kind of contact with you publicly. In terms of your eligibility when you get to campus, uh, first of all, at the D3 level, we do not require our student athletes to go through the NCAA clearinghouse. I know that the uh, NCAA Division I student athletes must uh, enroll with the NCAA clearinghouse, and I think it's like $160 uh, to put your profile or to create a, an NCAA account. Uh, at Trine University, I do use the electronic uh, NCAA form, so our student athletes do go to the NCAA Clearinghouse to create a profile, but it's a free profile. Uh, it doesn't necessarily check your grades, et cetera. It just gives you an NCAA ID number. Uh, as far as when you get to campus, the NCAA rules require that while you are competing, you are enrolled in 12 credit hours, uh, 12 full-time credit hours. That is a requirement of the NCA. Your individual school will determine their eligibility rules for you as far as number of courses, uh, progress towards degree, uh, GPA, et cetera. Each individual school determines what, their, what, their, what they deem as eligible. The NCA just requires that you are enrolled in 12 credit hours while you are competing. So for hockey players, since you do compete in the first and the second semester, you must be enrolled in at least 12 credit hours at all times. Um, it, it's, it's a little easier 
uh, sometimes, but if you've been accepted by your university, you will be eligible to compete when you arrive on campus. Uh, I think that kind of covers the two areas that I was pretty much thinking that we would need to cover. Uh, I, again, I think the big thing is contacts, understanding that a coach cannot contact you at a site if you're not a junior or senior. And even at a site, they can contact you at a game, but only at the conclusion of the game after you've been released by your coach to talk to that coach, to the NCAA coach. Uh, NCAA Division Three is a phenomenal platform. I am extremely excited about it. Uh, I've been in Division Three now for about 15, uh, yeah, about 15, 20 years, something like that. Uh, we at Trine do have a women's NCAA hockey team. We actually have four hockey teams here, men's NCAA, women's NCAA, and an ACHA2 and an ACHA3. Uh, but we're excited about our hockey. We have facilities on campus and I hope this answers some questions and I hope maybe even has, brings up some other questions. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan. That was great. For our participants on the call, if you have any questions for Dan, please feel free to drop those using the Q&A function and we will address those following our panelists. Up next, I'd like to bring up Natalie Darwitz. Natalie Darwitz grew up playing youth hockey in Egan, Minnesota. She was a three-time All-American at the University of Minnesota, where she was a part of two national title teams. She is the school all school's all-time leader in points per game, 2.48, ranked second in assists, 102, and third in points scored with 246. She has also had considerable success on the world stage, representing the United States in three Olympics, eight world tournaments, and 10 Four Nation Cup events. She has been a captain of several of those teams, a member of five gold medal winning teams, and was named the 2005 Woman of the Year, Women Player of the Year by USA Hockey. Natalie coached both high school and NCAA Division I hockey prior to joining the Hamlin University Women's Division III hockey programs as head coach in the 2015-2016 season. Since then, she has coached six All-Americans, helped the Pipers reach the Frozen Four in 2018, and the NCAA Championship game in 2019. Natalie will discuss the qualities coaches look for in prospective student athletes, what it takes to compete at the collegiate level, and offer advice to those aspiring to take their game to the next level. Please welcome Coach Natalie Darwitz. Thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. Um, um, and, and Dan, thanks for the info with uh, compliance. That's, I think, really helpful that you guys know what coaches can and cannot do. So as Jamie said, I, I both have experience coaching at the Division I level. Uh, I coached at the University of Minnesota for two years. Um, and now I'm at Hamlin University, which is a school in St. Paul. Um, and uh, as far as qualities we look for just in the recruiting process, um, just be, be forward and honest here. It's a strange year with, with COVID. And so things have really changed your recruiting wise. So I'm going to tackle two things, two perspectives. I'm going to tackle a coach's perspective, and then I'm going to tackle what you guys should be doing in some recommendations and uh, some advice for you guys um, if you do want to, hopefully, you're, hopefully the reason why you're on this call is to take the next step uh, in the chapter of, of your career and, and play college play college hockey at a D3 or D1 level. Um, so I'll kind of give you those two perspectives. So um, as, as far as a, a coach at, you know, a D3 uh, institution, um, we're nationally ranked. One thing for you guys to look for is roster sizes of a lot of colleges. You can easily go on a website and look at roster sizes don't look at just this year look at the past two to three years and get a feel for what those coaches are bringing in some rosters um, they might bring in 28 29 they might have 28 29 student athletes on their roster other coaches might have low 20s 22 23 um, so you can get an idea of, of how they're recruiting what they're doing um, so that's a really helpful thing i'm going to share the, the coach's perspective really quick okay um, first and foremost, in a, in non-COVID world, if we could see you guys play, that's where we are finding our players is live hockey. Obviously, given the situation, the times we're in, um, we're relying a lot on video. Okay. So if you guys are to send an email to a coach, um, 
please make sure you include video. It could be a best case scenario. You can cut up your video and show just clips of you. It doesn't need to be an hour video. It needs to be uh, 10 minutes max um, of clips. That's, that's about it. And don't be afraid to show, don't have it all be highlights. Just if it's, if it's a shift here and a shift there, um, qualities we're looking for, we're looking for how's your skating? What's your hockey IQ? Uh, what's your tenacity on the puck? Do you like to hang back or are you a pit bull and you're going in the corners and making stuff happen? So the qualities I look for in, in our student athletes, when I'm looking at some video from recruits is, uh, is those things is where are you at with the puck? Okay. If the puck's in the corner, are you just hanging out? Or are you willing to go make something and manufacture something and make it happen? Um, obviously, your skating is really important. Um, Jamie talked about my playing days. I'm, I'm 5'3", and I was known just for my skating and playmaking. We're not going to sit here and go, well, we're looking at only 5'8 players only. It's what is your skating? Are you strong on your skates? Are you fast? Are you agile? Are you athletic? Um, things like that. That's kind of what we're looking for. And then, again, the biggest thing for me is, you don't have to be the, the prettiest skater, the fastest skater. It is how badly do you want that puck? Okay. If you don't have the puck, are you making uh, plays and cuts to, to, to intersect pucks and, and, and passing lanes and, and try to get your, the puck on your stick? Or are you just kind of hanging out uh, five to 10 feet away from the puck? So those are really the things I look for is just the tenacity of wanting to go get the puck and make a play. Uh, are you going to dump it in or are you going to lower your shoulder and keep your feet moving and drive the net? Um, so there's a couple of things just on video, what we look for, um, as far as flipping it around on you guys, what you guys need to do. Um, I think it's really crucial to know, uh, that both D3 and, and maybe Dan can talk a, this a little bit further, um, when I'm done or you can chime in, but, um, interesting thing this year is with COVID is all D3 and all D1 players are basically getting a bonus year. Okay, so what that means is my freshmen that are on the ice right now will be freshmen next year when we play because they're awarded an extra year of eligibility with the NCAA because of this year. So, so messed up for lack of better terms. Um, so that's really important for you guys to know if you're a 21 and 22 grad year, that will affect you. So for instance, my team I have right now at Hamlin, we have 23 student athletes. Um, probably 21 will come back. Okay. And they'll repeat the year they're on right now. They won't repeat it academically. They'll get that year back athletically. Okay. So with that being said, we have five 21 committed, uh, five 2021 commitments for next year. We probably are pretty, pretty tight on that number of locked in. We might take one or two more, um, but when you take our existing roster and you add in our freshmen for next year, no one's really graduating because of that extra waiver rule. So that's something really important for you guys to know. So you have to be really proactive right now in what you're doing um, as far as reaching out to coaches. So in your email, emails are just fine. Uh, send a short little email who you are, who you play for, um, why you're looking at that school. Okay, and try not to make it generic and, and send the same email to every single coach you talk to. Look up that school and actually be generally, generally interested in going to that school. So if you are emailing me, you say, hey, Coach Darts, I followed you in 2009. You guys, you guys had a great year. You just came up short in that national championship game and following you, uh, your program. Uh, I really like how you guys play with speed and skill. That's something I want to be a part of that is going to be an attention getter to me that you actually know about our program and you're not just copy and pasting and sending the same email out to every coach. So my recommendation to you guys is start looking at schools seriously and pick out your, your top 10 schools and write those school, write those coaches an email, send video with that uh, email that you have. Um, and again, 10 minutes of just clips, it can be less than that. Uh, but we'll, we'll get the point after a couple clip, a couple shifts seeing you play. Um, and then don't be afraid to literally, I'll say bug us, bug us. Don't think you are bugging us by sending us multiple emails. We want that. Um, so don't be like, well, I sent coach Dowards an email two weeks ago and she hasn't responded. Send another one. Say, Hey, checking back in. 
Um, wonder if you have a chance to see the video I sent you, what are your thoughts? So um, you have to be proactive in that. A lot of uh, D3 schools, we only have limited amount of resources to recruit. So we rely on a lot of email. We rely on people that we know to, um, let's just say for instance, we were looking at someone at the Anaheim Ducks. Um, I have a, a past player, a player right now on our roster that plays for the Ducks. We're going to ask Hannah, do you know so-and-so from the Ducks? What, do you, what are your thoughts? So we're going to rely on third-party people that know that organization that's recruiting us or reaching out to us. Um, but be really proactive right now, especially because of the COVID. There's limited roster spots all across the nation just because kids can repeat an, a year athletically. Um, so that's my advice to you is just be really proactive. Um, it's not like the movies where we're going to come after you and, and, and find you. That's probably the top 2% of the, the, Nate, the top players in the nation. And they're probably going high end D one. Um, so you really just got to be proactive and, and reach out to coaches and, and send some video and then continually following up is my recommendation for you guys. So hopefully that helped. Um, again, if you got any questions at the end, um, about what we're looking for, our, tips on on what to say um feel free to, to ask those awesome thank you so much coach we really appreciate it i know there was a lot of good tidbits in there so hopefully you guys are taking some notes at home and like coach darwitz said if you do have any questions feel free to drop those in the q a and we'll address them later and also please note we do have a webinar scheduled for tomorrow afternoon uh, to further talk about recruitment best practices and what we should be saying in those emails so if that sounds interesting to you make sure you tune in tomorrow for that but again thank you coach darwitz for all of that wonderful information at this point i'd like to welcome our final panel panelists for today, Emma Tani. Emma Tani is a former Trinity College Division III women's hockey player and current marketing and promotions coordinator with the LA Kings. She grew up playing hockey in Orange County, playing for the Lady Ducks and LA Selects girls programs before heading to Shattuck St. Mary's in Minnesota to finish out her high school career. Today, Emma will discuss her hockey pathway out of California, her experiences as an NCAA Division III student athlete, and how her experiences as an athlete prepared her for a career in professional sport. Please welcome Emma Tani. Hi guys, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, first of all, I wanna say thank you so much to the Anaheim Ducks for putting this on. Um, it's incredible what you guys do for the Southern California hockey community. We cannot thank you enough um, on behalf of the LA Kings. So thank you so much. Um, so quickly what Jamie mentioned, I am a former collegiate um, hockey player. I played at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and I'm now the marketing and promotions coordinator for the LA Kings. Um, so just a little bit about my background. I grew up playing in Southern California. I started playing hockey when I was four years old. Um, and I played mostly boys hockey until I was about 12 years old, where I transitioned to playing specifically girls hockey. Um, so I did play for the Lady Ducks growing up. Um, we have that 2007 national championship. I was 12 years old. Um, I still cling to that memory, um, which is which is good. But I had a really, really good experience growing up in Southern California and playing hockey there. And I know a lot of you, I know not all of you, but a lot of you are from Southern California. So just want to let you know that there are so many opportunities playing in Southern California, um, which is shocking. I know a lot of people assume that in Southern California, you know, there's no hockey, but you guys are actually lucky in that there are a lot of rinks around here. And there is a lot of, you know, good opportunities and good clubs. So um, there is a pathway to, you know, division one and division three, which is great. And maybe, you know, 10 years back, that wasn't as much of an option, but it is now, which is awesome. So um, about my um, upbringing, I did the whole um, Lady Ducks thing. And then I transitioned over to the LA Selects for a year. And then I went to Shattuck St. Mary's for my junior and senior year. Um, after Shattuck, I decided to go to Trinity College in Connecticut. And I was kind of a borderline D1, D3 player. And I'm sure that maybe some of you are in that situation as well. So this is probably a good, um, a similar situation that you guys are in. So um, Trinity College, if you guys aren't aware of it, it's part of the New England Small College Athletic Conference. So it's known as the NESCAC. So um, it's a lot of like small liberal arts colleges in um, the Northeast. So um, I can tell you right now, I had an incredible, incredible time at Trinity. Um, it's the, the hockey is coming from Shattuck, you know, the hockey is not as strong as maybe a couple of division one programs, 
but there are really, really strong D3 programs. And I think a lot of people are now getting to see that, that D3 hockey is, you know, super, super competitive and as competitive as some of the lower D D1 teams. So um, don't let that deter you. I didn't let it deter me. And going to Trinity was one of the best experiences for me. Um, and it also is the reason that I have my current job, which is my dream job here at the Kings. So um, I can also tell you guys that like one of the biggest things is there are so many opportunities across college hockey and you guys, there's, you know, if you want to go to a small school or a big school, like you guys have the luxury of dictating what your college experience is going to be like. And for me personally, coming from Shattuck, I liked that small tight knit you know, community. So I wanted to continue on that trajectory. Um, so I knew that maybe a big school wasn't for me. So I ended up going to Trinity and I had an incredible, incredible experience. Um, the class sizes are, I think my biggest class size was probably 30 kids. Um, it's, I had seminars with seven kids in them. So it's a super, super hands-on um, incredible education. And that's um, through the liberal arts education. So if anyone is thinking about going that route, I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, it the education is, is just in so, 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 so strong. So um, that's kind of my, that was my college experience. And I had, you know, such a great time. Um, but one thing that I do kind of want to mention to you guys is I know that coming in as a freshman, I was, I didn't really know kind of what I wanted to do with my career. So I, and I think that's like, that's a very similar situation with most of you guys is that you kind of go into college, not kind of maybe with an idea, but not really sure. And once you get there, you can, especially with the liberal arts education, you can kind of figure that out while you're there. And it's totally, totally normal to not know what you want to do. So, and that was me was, I knew that I wanted to do something in the marketing or creative realm. And so I decided to major in American studies and studio arts. So um, through, through my classes and like arts classes specifically, I found that I was, you know, kind of good at art. And I, and I didn't know that that was, I played hockey my whole life. I didn't know that maybe I had that artsy side of me. And that really came out through my classes and my professors kind of helped me explore that side of me. And now that's a huge part of what I do now. So at the Kings right now, I'm in marketing. So I handle all of our, um, promotions. So that's, you know, um, giveaways in arena. I handle the merchandise. So promotion of any of our LA Kings merchandise, I do that. And I help with social media and I do, you know, I host events. So it's, I really got, you know, a, all my a liberal arts education provided me, you know, the foundation to be able to go into this job and have confidence in my abilities. And I think that a lot of people, if they, if I hadn't made that choice to go to Trinity, and have that liberal arts education, I would never be in the situation. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think for a lot of you, the instinct is to put hockey first. But I think for me, what I did is I put school first and I put where I wanted to go and like, what was gonna be the best fit for me first. And I think that that is kind of what led me to, to the success that I'm having now. So um, if that's any help for you guys, um, obviously once we do a Q&A, I can answer any questions for you guys, but um, it's, it's been like a really, really good um, opportunity. And even though, you know, maybe I thought I had this path, I had this D1 path in my mind and I went a little bit different in a different direction and I still was able to come out with a really good job and a really good education. So that's, that's kind of what I got. Thanks guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emma. I'm sure there are a lot of girls on the call that can probably relate and are in similar situations that you were in um, back in high school. So hopefully you girls um, found that information valuable. At this point, we would like to open the floor to our Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, I know I did see a couple come through already, but if you do have any other questions for our panelists, please utilize the Q&A feature at this time. Again, that's at the bottom of your screen and send those questions in. Um, if there are questions we are unable to get to 
to today. We'll send a follow-up email addressing those remaining questions along with their answers. Um, I did have a few questions that were submitted to me prior to the webinar, so we'll address those first. Um, the first question I think is probably directed towards Coach Darwitz, um, and it comes from a goalie dad. He wants to know how important is it for a girl to play on a girls team rather than a boys team? And I guess that can go for both players and goalies. Um, and he said, being that he's a goalie dad, the checking part of the game is less of a concern. So I'll direct that question to you, girls hockey versus boys hockey. It is a case by case. Um, I grew up playing boys hockey. And, and at that time, it was because there wasn't really any girls hockey. If I had to do it all over again, I probably would play it boys as long as I could. Wherever you're going to be challenged the most. Um, and, and like this dad, the, she's a goalie. So you can probably play in the, on the guy's side a little bit um, longer than I would. I, you know, I was five, three when I was in seventh grade, you know, and the, and then the eighth grade, the boys started sprouting up and, and, uh, getting big. So that's when I switched over based off size and physicality, she's in the net. So if she's getting challenged and if she's improving her game to me, hockey's hockey. Um, so whatever is going to challenge her and whatever she comes, comes home and is, has the most fun, then that's what you play. So I can't give you a, a, a female male play this, play that. It is based off your daughter and, and, and her goals and ambitions in hockey and how she's doing. Um, from a recruiting standpoint, whenever I, ha I have a recruit, especially a goalie, say their background and that they played uh boys hockey till this this age or this grade it actually piques my interest i like that so um just with my background i think that's really great awesome thank you for taking that question coach um we have another question and this one's probably directed to you again coach um how important is it to play in the spring and summer showcase tournaments should the girls be taking an off season or um, do you recruit heavily throughout the summer this is you know a, a tough question because i'm I'm an advocate for multi-sport athletes. I think there's there's something important to be said for doing other sports and being around other competition and, and teammates and, and just different athleticism. So I would like to say, put your skates away in the spring, um, definitely, and then pick them back up in the, in the summer, in the midsummer, late summer. However, it's, it's getting crazy out there where where everyone feels they need to play year round because they're going to miss this uh, high exposure tournament or this high intensity camp and that coaches, college coaches are going to be there. Um, if you're doing the right things in season, we're going to find you, right? If you're reaching out, we're going to find you. So I would like to say that, but I, I do, I do want to advocate for there, there should be a time where you put the skates away. I always put my skates away. I played fast for softball in the spring and middle of the summer. And I was absolutely salivating, uh, chomping at the bit to put my skates back on in middle of, after July 4th. And, and that made me better. It made me want to go to the rink more and, and made me excited for it. So um, that's my recommendation. I don't think, don't get in the trap of you absolutely need to do every single tournament. Um, they're all there are college coaches at summer stuff, but we pick and choose um, where we're gonna see the most kids in one spot. Great, thank you for taking that question. Um, this one could be directed to a few of you. Um, so whoever wants to take it, please feel free to do so. Um, do you use a, because I know there are a lot of different resources out there right now for recruits. Do you use NCSA, uh, the website to find hockey players or do you mostly go to games uh, to find your next players? Um, Emma, I don't know if you used any resources when you were um, looking at colleges or Coach Starwitz, if um, you look at any of those. Um, but anyone, please feel free to answer that question. I might defer to, I, it was, it was a long time ago. I did, do, I reached out, like Natalie mentioned, I reached out to all the coaches, like she mentioned, I did all of those things. So it's very similar, but if someone else wants to touch on that, that might be best. Um, I can give it a shot. Yeah, we actually do get um, emails from from recruiting companies. So I know um, the one Jamie mentioned is one. Um, there's women's college recruiting. There's there's a couple sites right now that's starting to get going. So that's basically a third party 
um, person that you can use to basically send emails for you. I personally would say save your money and do it yourself. If you can, you know, cut some video and, and send it, send a personal email to coaches. Um, I'm old school though. I, 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 I look at the same email from a kid and I look at a email from a recruiting website, basically the same. And I actually like the, the individualness of, of getting a, a personal email from a kid a little bit better. They might help you with some video aspects, but man, you kids are so tech savvy these days. You can cut some video easy. It doesn't have to be like, you know, with stars on it. It just needs to be here, here, here are some clips and it can be from your your mom and dad taking it with their iPhone. So um, don't think you need all the glitz and glamor um, to, to, to get recruited. Really it just, you can do the same amount of, um, stuff yourself and save some save some money for your parents those those sites will probably not like me now and send me emails anymore but <laughs> do, i would say do it yourself awesome thank you for that insight um this question it states do any schools whether d1 division three or acha consider walk-ons um wondering if there's a tryout process and if you do in fact consider walk-ons um so anyone feel free to answer that I can take this one just from a Trinity standpoint. Um, I know that for D3 schools, they do accept walk-ons. And we've had, I want to say, two, we've had probably three walk-ons in my four years that I played at Trinity. And one of them was a goalie that ended up starting. So don't let that in, discourage you. Walk on. Like if there's a school that you really want to go to and maybe you didn't you know, you weren't communicating with the coach in time, or you just think that you belong on this team, absolutely walk on. And, and, you know, there, we had a couple alternates or subs during games and stuff, but for the most part, the people that walked on played. So don't let that discourage you at all. Awesome. Thank you for taking that one, Emma. That is really awesome insight. Um, another question we had, it states, um, I heard that there is a specific date that after that date, a coach can reach out to you. Is that true? Um, wondering uh, maybe Dan or Coach Starwitz, if you could take this. I, I can take that one. Um, it, once you're a freshman in high school, you are a prospective student athlete and the coaches can contact you at that point uh, at D3 and D1 level. Um, like I said, the coaches cannot have face-to-face -face contact with you until you're a junior, but they can have the electronic communications with you as soon as you become a freshman. And at that point, that's when we really at the NCA start looking at what is a prospective student athlete and how can we have contact with them. Prior to their freshman year in high school, coaches can have contact with them pretty much at camps, et cetera. Uh, but once they become a freshman, that's when there is no date that they can have contact with you other than you're a freshman. Perfect. And that's specific for Division Three, correct, Dan? Uh, that is Division Three, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Natalie, it looked like you turned on your mic. Was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, just uh, Dan, Dan mentioned we can contact you, like, not face to face, but any other means. So right now um instagram um that's that's really big to to dm kids um so just make sure number one <laughs> it sound like your parents make sure your instagram and stuff is is uh if your grandma saw it she would give you the thumbs up right because we're because coaches will look at that stuff um but then just make sure you're checking your dm messages and kind of if obviously if we're not following you um we can get stuck in kind of the back channels of you have to go um, into your back DM. So just make sure um, social media is a big thing right now and, and probably will be in the near future for recruiting. The email obviously is a way to get communication through, but we, we certainly, when we're interested in a prospective student athlete and we see him play, we'll, we'll take a look and see if we can find him on Instagram and quickly DM him or something. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have quite a few questions here, guys. We'll take a few more um, and then whatever we don't get to, we'll just um, send follow up responses. Um, it, there's a few questions asking about how critical it is for girls to play um, either AAA or attend a prep school in order to continue on to college hockey. Um, I'm wondering if either any of you would be able to address that. Natalie might have a better answer for this, but I will say it is not necessary. I know that there are so many girls. I had it for, I had multiple friends who played out of Las Vegas who played boys hockey almost, I mean, I think maybe the entire time and who still got recruited. So don't don't feel the need for don't feel the need to go to prep school or to move to the East Coast and go to these schools. Like you I personally decided that this was the best for me, for my life and for my career, because I wanted to play at the highest possible level that I could. Um, but you can still play high level hockey in California or wherever you may be. So absolutely, I would say absolutely not. And parents, I hope that helps you. You can save some money. You do not need to send your kids to prep school. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for taking that, Emma. Um, I know quite a few girls too, just in our area, play high school hockey. Um, they're not playing AAA, they're not playing tier one, and they're still being recruited. So um, definitely it's a case by case situation, whatever you feel is going to be best for your athlete, but by no means do you have to go, uh, go away to a prep school or be playing AAA in order for coaches to look at you. Um, let's see a couple other questions here. Um, Emma, maybe you can speak to this one. Um, wondering what the time commitment looks like for a division three athlete athlete. How often are you on the ice? What does the game schedule look like? I'm wondering if you could talk to that a little bit more. Yeah, totally. So I was I, coming in, coming from Shattuck. I think I had pretty high expectations for what the hockey was going to be like, and it, it didn't disappoint you. You, I mean, you're in the gym, you know, two, three times a week, you're skating every single day. It's, it's, it's a similar commitment to D1. It's obviously not the same, um, but there is, a, I think there's a very strong, strong emphasis on education and making sure that your classwork is getting done. Um, and I'm, I cannot speak for D1 because I didn't play D1 hockey, but I, I will say that it is, you know, three, I want to say maybe three lifts a week and then practice every single day and then two games a weekend and for division three at least for the NESCAC it's I think it's a November to March season so it's November 1st is when the first day you can get on the ice so it's a little bit shorter of a season than a traditional um, division one program would be I hope that helps yeah that's fantastic uh, coach Darwitz is that pretty much aligned with what your girls are doing too normally yeah, um, and to kind of touch on the previous question about uh, prep schools or AAA, or, uh, there's there's no, we don't have any bias. I mean, we have high school hockey in Minnesota, so um, that's where most of our roster is from. But we next year coming in, we have two kids from out east. We have a kid from Alaska and a couple of Minnesota kids, and, and they play. That fits the gamut of, of every single background um, you can find imaginable. Um, as far as time commitment and what Emma talked about, she had it right on the head. I mean, uh, with Hamlin, we're a, a top D3 program. We actually played the University of Minnesota Gophers last year in an exhibition game. Um, so we, we, treat our, we treat our program and, and we're, if, if Emma was younger, we probably were recruiting her because like she said, she was on that D1, D3 bubble. That's who we're recruiting to make ourselves a top program. So um, there is a time commitment. Um, at the same time, we, we value a balance in life, um, academically, socially, athletically, those, those are kind of the big three. Um, so that's really important for us. We, I feel as a player, when, when I played my best, I was meeting all three of those needs. When it was just hockey, hockey, hockey all the time, or school, school, school all the time, something else suffered. Uh, and usually what suffered was what I was doing the most. Um, and so that's kind of how we do um, our time commitment is it's, we start a little bit earlier than, than uh, Emma's team did. We start October 1st um, and we've been practicing since then. Um, and then once it hits kind of late October, early November, it's games twice a week. 
Awesome. Thank you for providing that additional insight on our time commitment. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions come through regarding ages and what you should be doing at a specific age. And I just want to touch on that quickly. Um, tomorrow's webinar that discusses recruitment best practices will answer all of those questions for you. We're going to break it down by what level you're playing right now and what you can do at that level. Um, so please stay tuned for that one. And if you're not able to make it, we will send you a recording. So we'll address all of those tomorrow. Um, one final question that we have um, is, could you take a gap year and then play NCAA Division Three hockey? Um, maybe Coach Darwitz, you could take this one. Yeah, so say you're a senior now and, and with COVID things are you know, there's not a lot of openings um, because, you know, everyone gets their roster back if they choose, if those players choose to do a bonus year. Um, you can certainly take a gap year. Um, so that just means you're not going to to college right away and playing. So um, that's been that's happened before to a, a, a player or two of ours in the past um, that they actually came in as like a 19 year old freshman on the guy side, it happens all the time. The freshmen are like 22 years old because they're going to juniors. <laughs> I'm sure Dan um, with, with his men's hockey team sees them in full beards. So uh, as freshmen, but um, it's, it's totally fine. Uh, just make sure in that gap year, you have a plan on what to do. If you want to go play D three hockey or possibly go play D one, what are you doing? Are you just taking the year off and having uh, couch and potato chip time or, are you actually on a team and, and finding a place to play that's going to excel and, and grow you as a player and a person? So, um, again, if, if I'm a coach and I see a gap year, I'm not looking at that as a bad thing at all. And if I could just add on to that, what she said, this year is so weird. It, it's 2020 and it's unbelievable. But uh, you get at the Division three level, every student athlete gets – four seasons of eligibility, and they get 10 full-time semesters to complete those four seasons. At the division three level, a season is counted when you compete or when you practice after the first date of competition for that team. So if you're coming in this, now this year is weird. All these kids that are, that are on those teams this year do not use a season and they are not using any of their 10 semesters. Uh, because of the COVID situation. But if you come in next year and you practice with your team, that's one of your seasons as a freshman. That's one of your four seasons. I know every admissions counselor in the country is going to hate me for saying this, but maybe this year a gap year is not a bad thing to look at as long as, as you said with coach, you have a plan that you're not going to just be sitting around doing nothing, but you have a plan. Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. That was really great. Um, at this point, that concludes the NCAA webinar discussion. As a reminder, today's webinar was recorded and we will post it on ducksgoal.com and the link will also be sent out to each of you via email. Our next webinar, which is highlighting the American Collegiate Hockey Association, which is the ACHA pathway, is going to take place this afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific time. So hopefully you'll consider joining us for that webinar. But again, thank you so much to our wonderful panelists for providing insight on the NCAA student athlete pathway and experience today. It was really great. Hopefully you guys found this information really educational and informative. And thank you again to all of our participants for tuning in. Thank you so much, you guys, and have a great day.